In this video, we're going to take a look at how we can actually debug our assembly programs through the Linux command line. And what I want to do is I want to show you that a lot of the things that we saw in our online emulator can also be replicated through the actual Linux command line using programs like GDB. And that's primarily what we're going to focus on. We're going to take a look at the same program that we had before. That was this, uh, this Hello World program that was able to print out Hello World to the screen. I'm going to show you how we can step through it and see all of the different pieces that are required in order to make this work. So first off, we're going to launch this program into debug mode using GDB, which is a debugger that comes typically default on most Linux distributions. And it's a really valuable debugger for assembly, as well as other programs like C, you'd often see it used with. So to do this, we just do GDB, and then we type in the name of our program, which is Hello World. And you'll see that we'll get up this screen that will say all this information about uh, GDB and that it's been launched successfully. So in order to get this running, what we have to do is we have to add in a breakpoint. What a breakpoint is going to do is it's going to stop the execution of our program at a point specified by us, allowing us to be able to see what the current state of the memory is at that point and then step through to the next instruction and continue stepping one by one. The typical thing that we break on is we break on the start label. So we break underscore start. So what this will do is when we run our program, it will stop at that start label and allow us to start executing step by step from there. So once we have our breakpoint set, we could just type in run and you'll see that it started the program and it's hit the breakpoint at start. Now you can't really see any of this information right now. So what we have to do is we have to change the layout of GDB. So we could say layout ASM. And you can see that this gives us a layout that shows all of the instructions in our application. So you can see the first instruction, which is moving one into R0. And then we have um, the loading of our strings and our length. And then we have our system call. And then we have our end of our program with the system call for that. So this is giving us an idea of how we can actually look at the instructions that are associated with our program. Now, the next question is, how do we see the registers? There's two different ways that you could typically see the registers. The first is you could say info register and then type in the register that you want info on. So I could type in, for instance, R0. Oh, sorry, I have to do it as a lowercase r. So it'd be info register R0. And you can see that it has a value of zero. So there's, there's nothing currently in it. It's set to zero currently. So that's one way that we could see the register. Another way that we could see the register is we can actually type in layout regs, and you can see that that will show all of the registers above our instructions. Now, what you could do is you could type in control X and then O, and that will allow you to switch between the instructions and the registers. So you could see now I can scroll with the arrow keys and I could see each of the different registers that exist. So you could see like the stack pointer, um, the link register, the program counter, the CPSR register. So you could see all that information that we would typically have when we were running through the emulator. Again, that's control X and then type O after doing that. And that will let you switch your interface between the layout ASM and the layout of registers. So you can have both of them going and switch between them with control X O. Now from here, we can step to the next instruction using step I. So I type in step I, and you can see that it highlights the next line. So it executed the first line and moves on to the next one. And we can confirm that because if I look up at my register view, I see that R0 has been set to one, which is what happens when we do this move instruction, right? We move R1 into R0, and we can see that that actually did happen. Let's step I again. And you can see what's happened now is it's loaded our string into R1. And you can see that it has the address of the string now stored in R1. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about here is, well, how do we actually see the string in memory? So how do we actually see the stack memory? The way that we do this is we do the following. We do x slash. So basically what x is doing is it's saying examine. So we're going to examine a part of memory. And then what we have to do is we have to tell GDB, how many pieces of memory do we want to analyze and what format do we want to see it in? So for example, you could say 10 X. What that would do is it would show us 10 hexadecimal memory slots. So what's going to happen is we specify a starting point. So I would say address. So 
say I want to see the address of R1, I put dollar sign $R1. What's going to happen is it's going to start at the address of R1, which is 20098. And it's going to show me 10 hexadecimals starting at that point. So it starts at 20098, and then it goes to the next memory slot, and then the next one until it showed me 10 hexadecimal values. You can see when I press enter, that's exactly what happens, right? So we see um, the 20098, right? This is the first slot, and then the second slot, and then the third, fourth, fifth, all the way up to 10, right? So you can see that that generally shows us the hexadecimal values. Now, looking at these values here, it's not necessarily clear what each of these represents, right? We could see that each of these is a single piece of our stack memory. You know, th this really parallels the same ideas as our emulator, right? Nothing's really changed. There's still the same number of like hexadecimal values per slot of memory. We're still working with 32 bits for every single um, piece of memory here, right? So you can see that we have 10 32-bit slots. That's what's really happened here. Now, of course, looking at the hexadecimal numbers is a little bit confusing. So what you can actually do is you could specify different formats. I could view these in decimal by changing the X to a D like this. You can see that it gives us decimal values. Again, still not entirely clear. So let's do something different. We can actually specify character using 10 C. So C is character, D is decimal. Uh, just to give you a few more here, U is unsigned decimal. So that sort of gives you all the same ones that you would have had in the emulator, right? X for hexadecimal, D for decimal, uh, U for unsigned decimal, but then we also have this C for character, which is nice. When I do this one, what you'll see is our string, right? Hello world, uh, I don't quite have enough uh, numbers here. Let me put in um, 15 should be enough. Yeah, you see, there we go. We have hello world backslash N, and then you see that backslash 000, here, let me highlight it here. This right here is the null terminator that I was talking about. It's the special character that indicates the end of the string. So that's something interesting to sort of point out here. That's the null terminator for our string. So you could see that this is each of the different values that exists inside of our memory, right? You can actually see that each of these does represent the characters that we were expecting, right? We have the hello world string with the null terminator and the backslash n for the new line all stored in stack memory. So this allows you to actually see what's being stored in that memory. So you can see that you have a lot of the same uh, troubleshooting techniques as we had when we were working in the actual emulator itself. And again, we can continue through this. We can continue stepping through as much as we'd like. Um, you could see that we have generally the length of the string being stored and then we do our system calls and you know we move on as, as is, right? Um, if you want to just like complete the execution, you can just type in run again. And what will happen is, um, well, actually run will take us back to the beginning. Um, we could remove the breakpoint, for instance, and then run it again. But generally, the way they interact with the application through GDB would be stepping through step by step to sort of debug problems. And then the way that you would run it is what we saw in the previous video where we did the dot slash, uh, you know, and then running the program as is. So this should hopefully give you a bit of a better understanding of how we can actually debug our applications. And you're gonna see this a fair bit. Whenever we're working in assembly, I'm gonna be using this debugger to sort of show you the general idea of what is happening when we're going through each of these different memory locations. Um, so not to worry, you'll get a lot of practice with this. And um, I recommend just trying it out with a few of the other programs that we've done so far. Try writing them in this Linux format and then try debugging them and just see what happens. You know, it'll help you a lot with understanding the various components of GDB. So thank you so much for watching this video, and I will see you in the next one.